Are you ready to invest in yourself today? Welcome to the Wealth Builders Podcast. Where investment leader Billy Epperhart teaches you how to build wealth through applied biblical wisdom. Scripture says in Deuteronomy 8.18, Remember the Lord, your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. At Wealth Builders, our goal is to teach you how to build wealth through applied biblical wisdom in your finances, your business, and your investments. Now, let's join Billy Eberhart. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is this next topic is going to be the most difficult topic that I share with you, not the most technical topic, but the most difficult topic. And I'm telling you that because pray for me as I share this with you, because I'm going to come back to policies and procedures. I'm going to come back, but we're going to jump over to chapter 10 right here in this part. And I'm going to talk about some things on leadership. And uh, I noticed that that was misspelled, identifying. There you go. And I want to talk about in chapter 10, and you can see on the slide, it's chapter 10, page 109 in your manual. So just go to page 109, and I want to talk for a second about identifying and developing leaders. Now, I want to say this first of all, so you know that I know, okay? Some of the stuff that I'm going to share with you today is applied mainly in respect to volunteers. I also want to say this because it's being recorded that if you're in any kind of business where you're paying people, organization, nonprofit, you need to check either with your HR department and, or you need to check with your attorney regarding the, the laws, the employer, employment laws in your particular state uh, to make sure. But I'm going to talk to you just about how you deal with people in general. And I'm not going to try to caveat it. I'm going to teach it to you because here's why. Uh, most of the extension schools, and Mark and Mike and Carrie, correct me if I'm wrong here, and Tanera, if in most extension schools you have a husband and wife situation most of the time that are leading the school in some capacity, and then you have a, a, a paid position or two, uh, some are part-time, some are full-time, but there's probably, how many employees would you say that you, you would have in a, like Minnesota, how many do they have in Minnesota? Three. So there's three employees now. Is that it? counting Ken and Lori? Is that three in addition to? No, it's counting. That's counting Ken and Lori. So there's three employees. So do we have an extension school with more than three paid employees? Yeah, we do. Between three and five. Between three and five. Okay, in an extension school. And then what about internationally? What do we? Up to four, because UK is big. So you're going to have to go by the UK law. So what I want you to know is that I know that you can't just run in there like a bull in a china closet and, and disrupt everything going on and be legal doing it. What I'm trying to do is just teach you some principles here. Then you have to use wisdom about how those principles are applied. Okay, wisdom in your particular situation. And we all know, because I do, you know, I've historically done um, foreign business in about 10 different countries where money was transacted myself. Okay, so I understand, believe me, there's a lot that I didn't know and still don't know sometimes in a particular country. So all of what I'm going to share with you about this is something that you just have to learn and then have wisdom about how to apply so, but this will help you as an extension school director immensely. Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 3 says, To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness. And notice this phrase, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And everybody said... Now, in the planting of the Lord, I want, to, want you to see this for a minute. When someone is planted, you know, we know in the book of Psalms, the Bible's very plain, says those that are planted in the house of God shall flourish 
in the courts, right? So when we talk about being planted, let's talk about what that literally means. It means taking a seed and putting the seed in the soil. And when, the, when, when a, a seed is planted, the soil provides warmth, it provides nourishment, it provides moisture, so that that seed can grow and become a plant. However, it also uh, uh, brings to the table, the soil does, the weight of the soil on top of the seed actually brings resistant resistance to the new plant that is coming up out of the soil. And part of the idea is, is the weight of the soil that is on the seed and the new plant that begins to bud forth, the weight of the soil is helping that plant become stronger so that once it breaks up out of the soil, it's now able to handle the sun, the rain, and the wind because it's become strong enough to be able to deal with what is in the elements out there. So what happens is part of the role that the, that, um, the soil plays is it plays the role of resistance, but it also brings warmth and moisture and nutrients to the seed so it can grow. Now I like to say it this way, it's resistance. It brings resistance, not rejection. And what that simply means is, is when most people live and die in a non-growth environment, which you, I think you'll see that slide in this one, if that's true, then part of what we have here, and, and it's true in Karis Bible College, there are some things you can't do here at college, at Karis. Is that true? Am I telling the truth? And we're a grace place, right? But there's still certain things you've got to check in. You have key passes to get in and out of certain things. And then you got to take certain tests, right? To be able to get your grades and pass. Is that true? Yeah. So there's some expectancy. There's some, there's some, some people come in and say, well, I just don't want to, I just don't want to do all that. Well, that's fine. You either just can't come to school or you're not going to graduate something, right? There's some result. Okay. So as we, as we understand that, I'd always tell my kids this, you know, when my kids would come and we talk about the growth environment, most people live and die in a non-growth environment. I would always tell my kids, they would say, dad, can I go to, can I go, you know, at this party? And I'd say to them, well, my view of that is if you can sit on the ice, if you sit on the ice and it freezes you, then you can't go. But if you sit on the ice, and you can melt the ice, and I see him at church on Sunday morning with you, then I'm happy. So what part of our job is, is to create a growth environment which includes the warmth, the nourishment, the moisture, but it also includes resistance. Now, most people uh, who I meet through Andrew Walmack Ministries, and I just want you to know, anytime you have the opportunity to be associated with this ministry, I just want you to know it's a privilege and an honor. And because I'm teaching on this subject right now, let me say this, you always honor who the leader is under any circumstance. You never violate, and you always honor the doors you come through. So I want to teach you that. You always honor the doors you never violated. Never, never. Well, why are you telling me that? Well, I'm telling you that for this reason. Because I learned many years ago, most, and so because of that, most people that know me know me more from the business perspective. Um, because that's where my passion and that's where I am. And I've done a lot of business, a lot of transactions. But also, I pastored. And in pastoring, I had a little thing I did when we were smaller uh, with people, when we, say, just got started. Um, when people would come shake my hands on a Sunday morning, they'd shake my hands and I'd talk to them. Did I already teach all this here? 
I'd shake, my, I'd shake their hands on Sunday morning, and they would always say to me, and I remember this many years ago, they would say to me, Pastor, we'd love to take you to lunch that today. We got a nice steak place. Now, I, I discovered this by accident before, because the first time or two I said it, I really couldn't go in the sense of what was happening my, my, with my children. And uh, then Becky and I made a commitment. Now, this is a little bit strange with me telling you that you need to touch people, okay? But I would say to them, they would come, let's say a visitor, first-time visitor. They would come, especially first-time visitors. They would come and say, um, Pastor, we'd love to take you to lunch. We have a great steak place. Can we take you to lunch today? The first couple of times, uh, I don't know if it was my son or my daughter. One of them was sick. We needed to get back home. And I would say, I can't. I can't go, but I need to get home uh, with my children. My wife and I do. And uh, so I'm not going to be able to do it. Well, I discovered, because we always did follow up on Tuesdays, I discovered, not me personally, but I had somebody doing it. They, so they called this particular person this happened with. And I, don't, I, didn't, I haven't told this part of the story here. But, and and they, uh, they said, no, we're never going to come back because he wouldn't go to lunch with us. And I had a very legitimate reason not to go. Well, then I discovered something. You know what? I'm going to start doing that on purpose. So we made a decision that we were going to go home every Sunday after church and have family time. However, I offered to have dinner or coffee with them on Tuesday or Thursday. So I can't go today, but I'll be happy to meet you on Tuesday or Thursday of this coming week. Now that's pretty impressive. Personally going to meet for lunch or dinner. If you want to do coffee, and I'll even come downtown where you work. Everybody eats lunch. You don't have to travel to me. And I'm not kidding you. One out of three would never do it. Never come back. I just identified who's going to help me carry the water or not. So you say, Jesus said this way. Now, now I want to be clear. I want to be clear when I'm saying this. You always touch people in public settings. So if you're a pastor, you've been, you got a small church, to your biggest advantage is you get to shake everybody's hand. If you're an extension school director and you got 50 students, your biggest advantage is you get to hug everybody, pat everybody on the back, and shake their hand. That's going to build a school quicker than anything else you do. Amen. Just so we're clear. And I don't do it out of some, in my own mind, I don't do it out of some kind of technique. I'm doing it because I genuinely love people. But I'm trying to show you what I learned over the years, and it works in business too. You just have to be careful how you apply it there. But what you learn is Jesus said this. How many of you believe the Bible? So Matthew chapter 10, now don't hurt yourself. I said, how many of you believe the Bible? Okay, I just want to make sure I'm in the right group here. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 says, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now who said that? We're in the book of Matthew chapter 10. Jesus said, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents um, and harmless as doves. But beware of men. John chapter 2 and verse 23, because of the miraculous, in the new living says, because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust in him, but Jesus did not trust them because he knew human nature. No one needed to tell him what mankind is really like. So I discovered uh, over the years, whether I was doing a business transaction, I'll give you a specific story on a piece of real estate that in that day, it was a commercial building we were paying $750,000 for. And I didn't understand how to use this, uh, what I'm going to show you both positively and if you want to call it negatively or challenge or whatever, uh, then you, God bless you for doing it. But um, I'm going to show you something I discovered is that if I'm shaking hands with people, Karis Extension Schools might be a little 
uh, a little maybe up here on the scale, but I do, I use four stair steps of people. So when you're shaking hands and not necessarily in the setting we're in here today, because there's, you know, your third year graduate. So I expect you to be, you know, full of the word, right? But just out in the general population, you're going to meet people who are spiritually unhealthy. Or you could say spiritually hurt or unhealthy. The next group are those that are spiritually immature. The Apostle Paul addressed that quite often, actually. The third group that we have up there are those that are spiritually mature. And then the fourth group are those that are spiritually giving. What most people who don't understand what I'm going to show you do, they allow the spiritually unhealthy and the spiritually immature to determine everything they do in their leadership. Some of you don't know this about me, but in um, I actually officiated four of the Columbine funerals from the Columbine shooting in Colorado. I was asked to do five, but we could not do the fifth one just simply logistically, it wasn't possible. So I have a little bit of experience on what it's like to deal with a hurting community. And one of the things I discovered about Columbine was this. People that were doing okay before Columbine were doing okay after Columbine. And people that weren't doing okay before Columbine were doing horrible after Columbine. And I then I discovered a couple other things through that process. And I discovered that people really do fit. I'm not trying to buttonhole them, but they, you have to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. So extension school directors, as people come in, you're going to find some people that are spiritually immature and spiritually unhealthy that maybe come in. Now you don't tell them they can't come necessarily unless they don't do the other stuff. But even with pastors, what you'll find is that 80% of a pastor's time typically or a leader is spent right here. So what happens to the people that are ready to be developed, that are spiritually mature? What happens to the people that are already spiritually given? They're actually ready to lead. They're mature. They're ready to go. Can you develop me? You don't have time to create development because you're over here spending all your time. The way it should work is you spend 80% of your time developing these folk. They used to tell us in children's ministry, I always talk to the top of the class. You spend 80% of your time developing these folk, and then these folk take care of these folk. You still spend 20% of your time developing them and working with them and touching them and shaking their hand and that, but you, you take those you've developed and led and allow them to be able to minister here. So watch this now. I want to say something to you. I'm in care, so I want to say something to you. These people need to be loved. These people need to be led. So if you look up here, I know I put the old slide. These are potential time wasters. And notice I use the word potential. I didn't just say they're time wasters. We hope you learned something of lasting value today from this Wealth Builders podcast. If you'd like any tools, teachings, or resources mentioned in the podcast, you'll find them online at wealthbuilders.org. Wealth Builders exist to teach you how to build wealth through applied biblical wisdom in your finances, your business, and your investments. 
Wealth Builders podcast is produced by Celine Williams with music by Audio Jungle and narration by Greg Hunter. Wealth Builders is a nonprofit organization. We depend on your donations to keep this podcast running. Please consider donating to us on wealthbuilders.org.